Hello, I'm Vanessa Paloma Elbaz, and I am thrilled um, to see you here today for this launch of uh, this project on songs and women of bir and birthing uh, as part of the Cambridge Festival. And it's a pilot project for Choya Jewish Morocco Sound Archive des Archives Sonores du Maroc Juif, which was given um, an, a fund, an impact fund from the University of Cambridge Arts and Humanities Impact Fund to start a platform uh, with some of these recordings that are in the sound archive of these songs about birth um, that are sung by Jewish women in um, the Moroccan Sahara. So it's very interesting to start having the conversations around this. And today we will talk about what the platform will be in May once it launches. And we'll talk with various different um, cultural stakeholders from the region and also with some academics during the course of this whole week. And then on Wednesday, um, for the event itself, we'll have uh, a discussion and questions and answers. So we're very excited that you follow us along on this journey about uh, the complexity and, and the layers of, of and around this repertoire. So the project is called Sonic Accompaniment to Birth in the Jewish Sahara, and it's a couple of hour-long interview recordings that I did with Madame Sultana Azerwal in her house in Casablanca in 2015 and 2016. She was singing solo, accompanying herself uh, in, with percussion either on the table or on the sinia, on the plate. And I will come back around to this circular uh, form various times today, um, because one of the things that I have observed uh, in looking at Jewish repertoires in Morocco is these, uh, these layers that intermingle, that move around, but that actually have very clear boundaries during certain moments of the different repertoires. So uh, women sing local specific repertoires for life cycle events and for pilgrimages, and they sing at home, they sing in the home, and they sing to their family, they sing to their children and to their close community. Most often, a lot of what's coming out of their mouths is described by their family members as just pure blessings. They are this, this sonic force of blessing into the world. And their songs are at the very heart of the, these circles of repertoire. So they're the lo local core repertoire, most often in vernacular languages. So they won't be in Hebrew. They'll be usually in Judeo-Arabic or in Judeo-Spanish or in Judeo-Amazigh. And the other material that is in Hebrew, the liturgical material the or the Moroccan secularized, I would say, material, um, the European colonial and international repertoires, they're all performed outside of this local heart core of the materials. And those are usually most often in the public sphere performed by men and performed as a form of connection with their the larger community and the communities of the world. The women will sing some of these repertoires in the home, but uh, most often than not, when it, there's a public performance, it will be a male performer. In history, we had some female performers, but uh, they're much rarer than the male performers. So Sultana accompanies herself uh, with, with her sinia, uh, and I want us to hear, uh, to hear an example of this. So she and her family come from this region in the Tafilalit region of Morocco. Um, from a town called Boudnib, close to Ksar el Souk, a large oasis town, which is today known as El Rashidia, and which uh, her daughter recently explained to me as um, a very 
wholly an important part of Morocco because that is the same region where the royal family comes from. And that there is a level of uh, non-mixing in the population of that region. And, uh, and so people are, that are from there, she described to me as being really, really just from that region. Uh, which means that there's a, a, another layer of connection to land, to belonging, and also to the saints that come from that region. So there is a whole series of very important uh, Moroccan Jewish saints that are in the Tafilalit region. And it was also a very important region for um, after the expulsion from Spain for uh, Moroccan and Jewish mysticism. Many of the, of the great Kabbalist rabbis went to the Tafilalit region and were writing um, in, the, in the 15th and 16th centuries from there. The French Legion arrived to Boudnib in 1911. This is a, a photograph of them arriving to the region. And uh, now we're moving away from this round paradigm to, um, to a more square and binary and linear paradigm and just how these colonial theorists developed the idea that pre-colonial Morocco consisted of two areas, the Bled el Maxin, the land of the government, where the Sultan ruled over the plains and the cities and collected taxes more securely, and Bled el Siba, where many of the Amazigh mountainous areas were where the Sultan was relatively powerless, and it was a tribal, um, tribal organization. So Alexis Chotin, the French musicologist that came to Morocco and started the conservatory movement and all that, uh, gathered much of the Moroccan material at that time and started to transcribe and explain it in his manner. Um, and some of the explanations he put in this volume of Esperis, um, and where he describes the music as having two influences, two types of lifestyles. There was nomadism and sedentarism, two types of civilization, rural and urban, two types of, of spirit, of beingness, of état d'esprit, Marzin, again, and Siba. So the land of the Sultan and the land of disorder, he calls it, right? He divides this binary also into musical binaries, into rhythmic and, and melodic aesthetics. So he has this sonic colonial binary of Marzin being melodic and urban, civilized, refined, comfortable among pillows, he describes, lulled by trickling water from fountains. Time moves without distinction within warmth and darkness of patios. So this very orientalized image, but um, a, very, uh, a very contained image, we would say. And then Siba is uncontainable in a way. It's rhythmic, rural, primitive, uncultured, he describes, connected to nature, to periodicity and cycles, to seasons, day and night, to work and migration. So he, 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 he likens it to something that's disorderly, that cannot be ordered. I think it's interesting that he organizes it this way because, I mean, it says a lot about him, um, and about the world that he came from, which was informed by teachings such as Plato's Republic on music and gender binaries, where he says, one must distinguish between the types of music suitable for men and those suitable for women, and modes and rhythms must be fitted to them. What is grand and conduces to bravery necessarily characterizes the male, while what tends towards orderliness and discreetness will be more like the character of womankind. He says it would be a mistake to set a man's words to a woman's color and tune or harmonize the tune and postures of free men with the rhythms of slaves or give free the rhythms and postures to a tune or speech that contradicts the rhythms. So here we have rhythm, melody, space, and organization, all and gender, right? All as these recurring elements that are coming back and forth. In Chotin's collections that he did in Fez, published, these, he said, were from 1924, we have these two songs that are for birth. The first one actually is for rain and for fertility of the earth. And the second one is specifically to help the birthing process, asking the angel uh, of God to, to beat his wings to help 
the woman who's giving birth. In the next song, there's an invocation to Sidi Belabas, who's a very important marabou, a very important uh, saint, uh, Muslim saint, that, that he would deliver this birthing woman um, and that the child would come well. So obviously these, these are important moments for appealing to, to the sacred because of the great physical danger that the mothers very often were in. And right after that song, we have a song for the funerary or cortege or procession. So here we have actually this repertoire that really talks about these, uh, these issues that are connected to, to land. So rain, fertility, right? Birth and the power of saints. So the birth and the power of holiness and death. So it's a, a real connection to the, to the, impermeability of, of the impermanence of life. Um, we have uh, gendered spaces of sound and movement. So I'm coming back to this non-binary and more circular kinds of ways of living, non-tabular, non-organizational non square spaces. Uh, and so we have the, the way to dance was often in circle. Uh, we do actually in the Ahwash have, have dances that are face to face, which are men and women often, but not always. Uh, and then we have also this woman on the right that's making the bread in a circular movement. This circular theme actually is important to me because we see it again in the bindir, which is uh, to the right, you see the, the drum that is with a fish skin. It's a percussion instrument. And then we also have the sinia, the metal plate for the glasses that is used as an instrument. And the birad, the teapot, is actually this, this uh, it's used in, in the Talmud and also in some of the Amazigh uh, popular poetry to imply a sort of sexual innuendo. So because we must remember that part of the power that women had was around food and drink and desire as this driving force of fertility and creation. So I want to end with a short recording of Sultana singing uh, some of these songs and uh, invite you to come on Wednesday the 31st of March and eventually also to come and to see our our platform where we will be exploring all of these elements in much more complexity. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, we'll let you have to go out and do my beer inside.